Digital Equipment Corporation, otherwise known as either just Digital or DEC for short. At their height, were the second largest computer company in the world, second only to IBM. They kick-started the mini-computer revolution and created one of the most gorgeous-looking 1970s-ish computers ever created, which I happen to have a replica of here. Yes, we're going to have a look at the history of DEC and this PIDP-11 replica. DEC was founded in 1957 by Ken Olsen and Harlan Anderson. The two men met whilst at MIT, where the two men had been working with the Whirlwind computer and had later gone on to get involved in air defence work at the Lincoln Laboratory in Lexington. It's why at the Lincoln Lab two important things happened to Ken. Firstly, he noticed that a lot of his fellow colleagues, they preferred working with a smaller computer that they had access to rather than the big IBM machine because, well, they were allowed to directly interact with it rather than just have jobs that they put in a pigeonhole somewhere for a system operator to run. This led Ken to the conclusion that the future of computing was interactive. The second part is Ken had also acted as the lab's liaison with IBM which created in Ken a strong dislike of hierarchical corporate structures that were very dominant in IBM. So this experience really shaped Ken's later on management style when he set up DEC. Both Ken and Harlan decided to leave MIT and found their own company together. Now, even the way they funded this new venture was innovative for the time. For most people, if you wanted to start a business at this time, you either borrowed money from family because you were relatively wealthy or from a bank. But not Ken, oh no. They did something that would now be considered the standard way that a technology company would get itself funded. Yes, venture capitalism. The newly formed American Research and Development Corporation would invest $70,000 in return for a 70% stake in DEC. That may be one of the single smartest investment decisions ever made in American history. With that initial investment secured, DEC rented a small space in a mill in Maynard, Massachusetts, a building and site they would eventually come to own. But at this point, DEC only consists of a handful of people and started building what they refer to as digital laboratory modules. These were small little boxes containing logic that you could link together at the front using essentially little banana plugs. They were extremely useful for testing other digital equipment like memory, etc. And they sold very well to other computer manufacturers and manufacturers of digital equipment. Now you may be wondering why the world famous computer company DEC didn't start by making computers. Well, there is a reason. In the early 50s, lots of new computer companies had started and then promptly gone bankrupt. The reason for this being, by the time they got their product to market, their product was obsolete. Even large companies like RCA and GE who had computer divisions were failing to make money from it. So, originally digital tried to avoid doing the whole computer thing to avoid spooking the money people. Now, this initial module business worked out pretty well for DEC. In their first year, they sold $94,000 worth of these modules, which would be the equivalent of just shy of a million dollars today. That meant within its first year, DEC was in profit. These modules were fast and they were reliable, and Ken put that down to following MIT's tradition, which was an approach towards engineering reliability, essentially. After the digital laboratory modules, DEC started creating what it referred to as digital system modules, which were essentially the same electronics, but they were packaged in a very different way. Essentially, this new packaging didn't involve plugs on the front, but actually big connector cables at the back that could link a whole bunch of them together in a rack. This meant you could create systems that had, well, the kind of density needed to make computers, and, well, people did start making computers from them. And one of those companies that started making computers from them were DEC. In 1955, DEC unveiled a prototype of its first ever machine, the PDP-1, with PDP standing for Programmed Data Processor. You can see while still even attempting to build a computer, DEC is very much trying to avoid using the word computer. The first PDP-1 to ship was in 1960, and it was sold to Bolt, Bernack & Newman Inc., a company founded by two MIT professors. The PDP shipped with 4,096 words of memory, each word being 18 bits in length. It had a paper tape reader, and typically came with a modified IBM typewriter, which it used as a printer, and a radar screen, which it could use as an output device. Now the PDP-1 gained quite a lot of interest because it was actually an interactive computer. Users could actually use it. It wasn't locked away in a big room with system operators, with programmers and other users never being allowed anywhere near the machine. The PDP-1 was relatively successful, selling around 50 units, which may not seem a lot now, but then 50 computers was a lot of computers. Now when DEC first announced the PDP-1, they did mention that they might work on a large version of it. And after some people expressed interest in purchasing such a machine, DEC got on with it. Initially, they tried designing a 24-bit version called the PDP-2, but that one never seemed to escape the design stage. There was then the PDP-3, which did make it from designing through to being built, but apparently they only built one of them. 
Then there was the PDP-4, which was essentially a cost-reduced PDP-1. Yet they repackaged the electronics to change the memory for something that was a bit slower to get a much cheaper machine. This version also sold quite well, selling around about 50 units. Tech would then re-implement the PDP-4 as the PDP-7, a design based around their new flip chip module. The PDP-7 sold around 120 units, one of which was famously used to create Unix on. Now, DEC were not quite done with models based on this design, and in 66 they created the PDP-9, which ran about twice as fast as the PDP-7 and sold more machines than all the others put together, selling 445 of the things. You may have noticed some gaps in those PDP numbers. Well, those are all the machines based around the PDP-1, but DEC didn't just stick to things based around the PDP-1 design. DEC created a new design in the PDP-5 first introduced in 1964, and was advertised with the line, now you can own a PDP-5 computer for what core memory alone used to cost. DEC kept producing the machine until 1965 when they introduced a new machine based on its design but using the new flip chip packaging, the PDP-8. The 8 is often referred to as the first real mini computer because of its size and also its price tag. Sales were incredibly strong and it really dominated this whole section of the market. In total, DEC sold 1,450 of these straight 8 machines, before it was replaced again by new iterations of essentially the same design. As well as kickstarting the mini computer revolution with the 5 and then 8, DEC also decided it was going to get into the mainframe business, thus creating a brand new machine, the PDP-6. The PDP-6 commercially was quite the failure, actually. It really struggled against the likes of IBM or Honeywell even though it was at quite a decent cost compared to them. Only 23 of them were ever actually sold. However, all hope was not lost for the PDP-6. As like all the other models of PDP, they re-implemented it in flip chip packages. And thus the PDP-10 was born. The PDP-10 was quite the reverse of the 6 in that it was successful. Really quite successful, in fact. With DEC selling around 700 mainframes come the end of its production run in 1984. The final PDP we're going to talk about is the PDP-11. This was the last new PDP architecture that DEC designed. And although there are PDPs with higher numbers like the 12 and the 16, these were essentially all just cost reductions or repackaging of earlier PDP architectures. The PDP-11 was created at a moment of great change for the computer industry. Previous DECs have been based around the idea of a 6-bit character. Thus we end up with some very odd word lengths like 38 bits for a machine, or at least odd by today's standards. This is the moment that ASCII appeared, American Standard Code 2, which gave us an 8-bit encoding for characters. This also marks the moment we stopped talking about memory for machines in terms of words, but in terms of bytes, i.e. 8 bits. DEC's first attempt around building a machine in multiples of 8 was the PDPX. But Ken Olsen was not fond of the idea of the PDPX, as he thought that it couldn't do anything that their existing 12 or 18 bit machines didn't do. This led to the leaders of the PDPX team basically leaving DEC and starting Data General. Now, this would prove to be an awkward moment for DEC, as Data General would go on to be one of their larger competitors, and in 1969 would release the Data General Nova, a 16 bit mini computer that would prove very commercially successful, much no doubt to the annoyance of DEC. However, this gave more than enough impetus for DEC to start working on their own 16-bit machine, and thus the PDP-11 was born. PDP-11 was released in 1970, and various versions of the PDP-11 would stay in production all the way until 1996. This is an incredible amount of time for any system to stay in production. Now, I should point out that the 11 wasn't just one computer that they just kept making all the way from 1970 to 1996. No, there were many revisions of the PDP-11. The first version released in 1970 continued on with, well, very 1950s technology in that it used core memory. For those of you not familiar with core memory, core memory is actually not like modern RAM, even slightly. It's a small series of ferromagnetic rings that can either be magnetized or demagnetized. You have a sense why going for it. Magnetize it, it's a one. Demagnetize it, it's a zero. So core memory tends to look, well, like chainmail, incredibly fine chainmail, because yeah, it, it was very similar to chainmail in many ways. As the 70s went on, actual modern RAM was invented. So that means the PDP-11 could switch from its core memory to modern memory. Now, interestingly, I did find a small winch from a DEC user group regarding this. It's one property of core memory that modern memory doesn't implement. In core memory, when you turn the machine off, it holds everything that was in core memory. All the ones stay ones, all the zeros stay zeros. It doesn't need electricity to work, only to change state. 
So that meant when you turned your PDP-11 off, it kept everything that was in memory when you turned it back on. Yep, it was all still there, so you could just resume the program you were running before. Of course, when they invented modern newfangled RAM, if you turned your PDP-11 off, you lost everything that was in memory and had to reload it all off tape. And yeah, for some PDP-11 administrators, apparently that was a problem. Of course, memory was not the only technology to change during the lifetime of the PDP-11. The first versions generally tended to be built of single transistor logic, i.e. each individual discrete transistor put on a board together. And that soon gave way to LSI, large-scale integration, where a number of transistors would be put on a single chip. Those chips would then be linked together on the board. Of course, as the decades rolled on, more and more transistors got in the chip, until eventually the whole of the PDP CPU was more or less implemented in one chip. There were many models of PDP-11, not just based around the changing technologies, but also based around the size and capability of the machine. The replica kit we have here is of the PDP-1170, possibly one of the most iconic looking of all the PDP-11s, with its plum and purple switches, and its whole blinking lights interface. To be honest, future models of the PDP-11 would never look quite so interesting, in fact they start to get quite dull towards the end. So it's not surprising that our kit vendor has chosen this era as the one to recreate. Now, the reason it's called the Pi DP11 rather than the PDP11 is, as you guessed it, yes, at the heart of it lies a Raspberry Pi. Yes, the Raspberry Pi runs the emulation software and connects up to this front panel interface we're going to build, so you can do the whole blinking lights thing. Right, time to have a little look inside the box. Now, as you can see, we've got a nice sort of front panel, we've got a case, we've got a little wooden stand for it to all go on, and of course the printed circuit board that makes the thing up, and a big bag of electronic components and one bag of switches. So you know what this means, oh yes, there's going to have to be a soldering montage. But before we settle into our soldering montage, I should probably tell you something. I'm not brilliant at soldering, I mean I'm really not. I mean you're about to see that for yourself, admittedly. But even though I'm not great at soldering, honestly, through hole stuff, it's not that hard, even for someone with my skill level. I didn't help myself in that I started off doing this with the worst possible solder that had, like, sod all flux in it. So I started to put some external flux I had on, and I tried to get as little on as possible, so I started using the end of this little wooden stick. Yeah, but even that was, like, way too much flux, which you'll see me have to clean all this mess off the board later. But yeah, a bit of alcohol, it eventually came off. Now, I solder everything on in a particular order, so the components that are closest to the board and lowest in height, they go on first, and then the components that are a bit taller, and taller, and taller. Although you can see, part way through, I make a pretty massive cock up, which I now have to fix at the end. I'll tell you what, I'll leave it to the end of the soldering montage, see if you can spot what I mess up, and then I'll tell you at the end if you were right. Let the montage begin! I'm another SOS Written with invisible ink Someone's been shooting bottles Just to see how fast they'll sink If you found me, would you know me? The ocean washes things clean when you want me, I'm a warship When you hurt me, I'm a dinghy When you need me, I'll always be a submarine Many planks that I'm running out of deck. If you'll be my foghorn, then I'll be your shipwreck. So, darling, don't fall asleep at your radar screen when you want me. I'm a warship When you hurt me I'm a dinghy When you need me I'll always be A submarine
So now the board looks more or less all done. But can you spot the major mistake I made? It's the Raspberry Pi connector. It's soldered on the wrong side of the board. Yes, apparently I did not realise that it goes on the reverse of the board when soldering this. I think I was too busy checking up all the diodes on the right way around. So of course if we put the pie in on this side, well then it'd cover up all the LEDs which kind of ruined the point of the whole thing. So it's time to get my desoldering gun and remove the connector. Yes, tiny bit of an unsoldering montage. Very small montage. There we go, that was the small unsoldering montage. Now with the Raspberry Pi connector on the correct side of the board, this machine's going to be a lot more usable. Oddly, this was the hardest bit of soldering of the whole project, as it was quite cramped there and I had to be careful not to melt either the LEDs or the switches. Luckily, I managed not to burn any of them, which is pretty good. And of course, if you were making this kit at home, you wouldn't make that mistake and therefore you'd have avoided the hardest bit of soldering. Yeah, no, totally my own fault. I mean. It even had a silk screen on the other side showing me where the pie was going to go. Uh, well, it's now time to switch this thing on and see if it works, and... Sort of. Yeah, not every lamp's supposed to be on at once. This is when I realised I've soldered the lamp test switch in the wrong way round. Yep. So, in its resting position, every single lamp is on. And if I hold the switch down, the lights go back to their normal state. Oy. Yeah, so I have to desolder that switch, put it in the right way around, solder it back in. Don't worry, that there, there isn't another montage. We are montaged out. So now with our replica complete, it's time to see what you could actually do with one of these things. Now, first I should point out, there are a lot of operating systems for the PDB-11. One of the most significant, of course, being Unix. The first time most people got to see Unix outside of the AT&T labs was on the PDB-11 as that was the second machine that the Unix team ported to after their PDP-7. Unix was a huge hit with computer science departments in universities across the world, and most of them bought themselves a PDP-11 so that they could try this thing out. Of course, DEC also produced their own range of operating systems, and there were a lot of them. In fact, let's let some just casually scroll up the screen. Look, it's still scrolling. There seemed to be an operating system for almost every occasion. In fact, a friend of mine who actually used one of these commercially, the operating system he used was Concurrent CPM. That allowed him to have many different users running his application on the PDP-11 he kept at his office, which no doubt kept his office nice and warm and toasty, even in winter. It's worth probably noting that, also, he had a bit of hearing loss come the end of the use of his PDP-11. Staying in the same office as a PDP-11 may not have been the wisest choice in the end. Now, we should probably have a chat about the series of attractive looking switches and flashy lights on the front of this thing. Oddly, they are not just there to make this thing look cool, although that is quite a nice side effect. No, these switches allow you to do the lowest level programming and debugging of the PDP-11 you could possibly think of. Yep, you can use these switches to jump to particular memory locations, see the contents of them, and set the contents of said memory locations. You can in fact enter whole programs this way using the switches. I mean, don't worry, I, I'm not going to, that's going to take way too long. I mean, this video is already coming up on 30 minutes and we're not done yet. Yes, blinking lights machines have an equivalent of the Hello World program called Chase, where it makes the LEDs flash from one side of the device to the other. But don't worry, I'm not going to take your time entering the program in. The emulator this thing uses for the PDP-11 has another use for the switches as well. By using the switches to select a particular number, you can choose which operating system your emulator is going to boot into. So, for example, if we set the number 102 in Octal, the emulator will then boot into BSD 2.11. Of course, you do have to enter that number in in binary format. So that switches 6 and 2 set to 1 for anyone playing along at home. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that this is how most PDP-11 developers actually wrote their code. They, they didn't. Now, typically you'd only write small bootloaders or very little things this way just to check the function of the machine. 
Now, normally a developer would, you know, write an actual programming language on a terminal connected up to a PDP-11, then compile or interpret their code and run it on the machine that way. Speaking of terminals, there's a couple of ways you can connect a terminal up to your PDP-11. First of all, you can just SSH into the Pi, and that by default will open you up in a terminal on the PDP. Or, with a bit of additional hardware, you can add a couple of serial ports and connect up an original serial terminal, like a VT100 for example. Or of course if you fancy, you can plug in your modern PC that way as well. Or a retro machine with some terminal emulation, like a BBC Micro, or an Amiga, like you can see here. Now feels like a good time to talk about storage. The PDP-11 actually had a ton of storage options, starting with a very humble punched paper tape, then there was magnetic tape, and of course hard drives, really really massive hard drives, although I don't mean in terms of storage capacity, I mean just physically huge. And eventually we even got floppy drives, 8 inch floppy drives, but floppy drives nonetheless. Now one of the reasons the PDP-11 had so many storage options was it had an open bus. Which I mean there was a card bus that, well, lots of different manufacturers could make cards for. That bus was known as the Unibus. Lots of different vendors started to sell cards for the Unibus system. Which meant more people bought PDP-11s, which meant there was a larger market to sell cards to, and so on and so forth. This opened up all sorts of options to the PDP-11. Later on the PDP-11 would gain a new bus called Qbus which had a higher bit width than Unibus and allowed for more complicated cards. Now each Unibus segment would allow you to connect 20 devices, but you could get something called a repeater which would allow you to add another 20 devices onto that. This meant you could put in things like more serial cards so you could have more serial terminals connected to it, or more printers, or hard drive controllers so you could have early SCSI connected to it, or floppy drives, or network cards, the list just goes on and on. This open bus idea is something IBM would later go on to borrow for its PC line of machines, which helped make them such a success as well. The PDP-11 would be the most successful of the PDP range of machines, and would also be the last new architecture from DEC when it came to the PDP. There would be PDP machines with higher numbers than 11, but they would always be some form of retread or cost reduction of an existing architecture. Sometimes just trying to hit a price point, other times trying to get into a new market like say industrial control. The 11 had success more or less anywhere where a computer could, well, have success. It was used in companies ranging from safety footwear providers to universities. It was used by telephone companies, newspapers, accounts departments, you name it. Heck, some people even tried to run these monsters in their home. Admittedly, people with very big homes and very deep pockets. Yes, Trevor, I am talking about you. Now, one thing I've not talked very much about is Ken Olsen himself. Now, normally I don't particularly cover the founders of companies like this, because generally they tend to be, well, they're often described as geniuses, or brilliant, or incredible, but they're typically also described as assholes. Yeah, it does seem by and large, particularly in the US, that creating a computer company is also not compatible with being a decent human being. Yeah, it struck me when researching this thing, reading the comments from various DEC staff members of just, well, how much they all seem to like Ken. I mean, when the company closed and Ken Olsen had been not there for quite a while, still, it's amazing how many of them wrote down, well, their favourite memories of Ken. So, having been struck by how much staff seemed to like Ken, I decided to do a little bit more digging into it, because, you know, I assumed if I dug hard enough, I'd soon discover that actually he was kind of a bit like the others. But no, that's, that's not what I found at all. Yeah, it seems Ken was actually a really nice guy by the sounds of things. I mean, not just he was pleasant, I mean, he clearly was. I mean, he listened to his fellow staff members. He didn't have a hierarchical management structure. I mean, at some point in time, Ken was the richest person in America. But did he show it? No, Ken was quite humble. I mean, here's a man who's one of the richest people in America and drove to work every day in a beat-up red old Pinto, because anything else would have been too flash. He would regularly visit random deck sites and would happily be ID'd by members of staff that didn't believe it was him. But these sort of things didn't just seem to extend to Ken the man himself. He wasn't just pleasant. It was, well, the deck itself was pretty, well, progressive. Now here's an example. Ken made pretty sure that deck hired quite a lot of women. But not just on the factory floor, no. Deck hired women engineers, and they had internal promotion for women, with women rising up to vice president positions. And this is in the 60s and 70s, the kind of time, well, when in America, people had some pretty strong views in the position of women in relation to cooking equipment. 
Tech also adopted shift patterns that fitted well in with parents' drop-off and pick-up times from schools. Again, not a thing that was big in the 60s and 70s. And if you're thinking, oh, well, it's just gender equality that Deck was into, oh, no. No, Deck brought in people to look at racial equality and deliberately set up factories in minority neighborhoods. The other thing Deck had going for it from this standpoint, which I almost struggle to believe that a major American corporation could do, was Deck would offer members of staff a mortgage. Yeah, it seemed Deck was very aware that some members of its staff would not get a mortgage from traditional financial institutions, and not because of their income. Oh no, I think we all know why those people were not being offered mortgages. And DEC as a form of affirmative action? Well, DEC set up a part of the business that, well, gave mortgages to its staff. Yeah, it seemed it was not just enough for DEC to make things fair for staff inside the company. It also tried to make things fair for staff members when they were outside the company too. It's not that surprising that after DEC closed its doors, in its hometown of Maynard, quite a few things got named after Ken Olsen and quite a few statues to boot. Now there are a fair few things that Ken said that sort of have stuck with him like a millstone around his neck, but only because, well, they weren't really interpreted to what he actually meant. One quote that's often attributed to Ken is that nobody needs a computer at home. Now, if you take that quote at face value, you'd assume that Ken kind of missed out on the whole home computer revolution as he just didn't think it was gonna happen. But of course, that's not what Ken meant. Ken didn't mean that people shouldn't have access to computing power at home, he just meant that they shouldn't have the physical box that is a computer. In fact, what Ken thought they should have is a terminal. As the world of computers was evolving and changing so quickly, he didn't think that the average person should really buy a computer, because by the time they'd had it for a couple of years, it'd be obsolete and they'd have to, well, buy another one. He thought they should have a terminal, which they could always hook up to the latest and most powerful computing equipment going. So, you can interpret that quote as Ken being behind the times, or you can interpret it as Ken being so far ahead of the times, we're not even quite there yet. Now, some of you might know about the Eastern Bloc's habit of cloning home 8-bit micros. For example, cloned versions of the ZX Spectrum were pretty popular in Eastern Bloc countries. Well, British home micros weren't the only things they cloned, oh no. When it came to academic and business computing, well, the PDP range got cloned too. So, DEX lines of machines are actually a big part of computing history in the Eastern Bloc nations as well. So, although DEC may not have made these machines, they certainly had a huge impact on that side of the Iron Curtain too. Now, this is where we're going to leave the story of DEC. Now, I know some of you will be screaming at your screens, yelling, What about Vax? What about Alpha? Well, this video is already getting quite long, and I've got an Alpha box sat right next to me that I really want to do a video about. So, my Alpha box, Vax, VMS, everything, that's going to get another video all to itself. So, it just remains for me to say thank you very much for watching. I'd also like to thank Richard Masters and Poke, who, when I messaged saying, I've got an odd request, can I use some of your music in a solder montage? He said, Yeah, you, you had me at odd. So, thank you for letting me use Submarine and Helen Daniels is dead. As ever, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button and share it with other people that you think might like it too. And if you're feeling in the mood, why not hit that subscribe button? Because it really has been helping the algorithm like discover these videos and show them to people, which is, you know, very handy.